back to Sci-Fi Live from New York Comic Con. Wrapping up that final day. Got an exciting crowd here, because we're about to talk about Cosmo's Possible Worlds, and we've got some wonderful people who work on this show. We got Jason Clark, the executive producer. We got Brandon Brugga, the co-writer and co-director. We have host Neil deGrasse Tyson. And we have executive producer, writer, and director, Andrew Yan. Thank you all for being here. I gotta admit, I'm, I'm a little nervous because I feel like I'm with some of the smartest people <laughs> right now. Uh, so I'm just curious, like just from the beginning, what got you all interested uh, from, from, the, from the beginning with, with science, with the universe, with all of this, what got you that first, that first drive to want to know more about all this? I'll just start for, my, for myself. I born and raised in New York City and in the Bronx, Bronx in the house. And I had my first encounter with the night sky was the Hayden Planetarium. Because as New Yorkers do not have a relationship with the night sky. Because the buildings are tall, the lights, and in the day there was air pollution. And so my first night sky was sitting at the Hayden Planetarium and they dimmed the lights, the stars came out, and I thought it was a hoax. Because I, I knew how many stars there were in the night sky. There were like 14 stars visible from the Bronx. So, so, but it was a beautiful hoax. And it would not be until many years later where I would recognize that this, they were attempting, the educators and scientists were trying to bring me the universe that I would not have otherwise experienced. And so I've been hooked ever since from age 9, 10, and 11. What about the rest of you? Okay, well, I grew up in Queens. And, yeah, all right. And, uh, and I looked through a telescope on 195th Street and 73rd Avenue, and I saw the rings of Saturn. And it was one of those moments, I was about seven or eight, where I realized that something I imagined was much better than my imagination, much more stunning and beautiful. And then I had the greatest good fortune to fall in love with a guy named Carl Sagan. And, uh, and together we did the first Cosmos. And uh, I've been in love with science ever since. Nice. And what about for you guys? Anything in particular that, oh, was this working? <laughs> Uh oh, did that work for you? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah. I'm from Montana. Yeah. <laughs> Where... You're lying. You're only from Montana. <laughs> Don't even say that. A lot of lot of stars, and that's guy. Um, really, one of the, my great, one of my first great inspirations was Cosmos in 1980, when I was a teenager. Uh, really, made me realize how important critical thinking was and that it was a lens through which to see the world that I was waiting for. And it's surreal to me that I'm working on the show all these years later. Very grateful. Nice. Yeah. Um, I'm from here, from Chelsea. So I don't know who's from Manhattan, but I, uh, I think the moment for me where I saw the possibilities of what science can do was when I was in grade school at PS41. Levis Street, 6th Avenue, yeah, 41. And uh, they rolled the television into the schoolroom, and we watched the landing on the moon and the first walk on the moon. And I remember thinking, having kind of an out-of-body experience as a kid, going, this is possible. This is incredible. This is, this is real. This is happening right now, hundreds of thousands of miles away in the most extreme circumstances and, and, and environment. And I thought uh, anything could be possible at that moment as a kid. And, you know, to be working on Cosmos now is, is a dream for me to come true, to tell these stories. That's amazing. So is that kind of inspiration, is that's what you were hoping for bringing the show back, is like helping the next generation see, see these worlds and see, see the stuff that's out there to have that same kind of feeling that you guys had when you were kids? Not just that, but also to be aware of the awesome power of science to reveal the grandeur of nature and the universe to all of us and to reintroduce into our life the notion, this crazy idea that it matters what's true. 
that you can't get to Mars without... Let's hear it for that. You can't get to Mars on lies, and you can't cure smallpox with lies. Those things have to be, every single step of 100,000 steps has to be true. And that's why we're so lucky to be able to do Cosmos together. Uh, now, did you find it challenging to bring, not only to bring this show back, but also living in an age where we have the internet and people write things out there that, let's just be honest, aren't always the true facts. <laughs> so is that something that you guys were hoping to accomplish as well, of just being like, here's the truth, here's something that you can actually see that, that is correct out there? No, it's, it's, it's deeper than that. It's not, here's the truth, replace it with your falsehoods. It's, here's a way to understand why this is true. Yes. That's what you present. Otherwise, you're just, you're just swapping one bit of information for another, and the person is not more empowered to evaluate one or the other other than by the authority of the show itself. And no one should ever believe things on authority. You need, you need to have the methods and tools built in to ask the question, why do you think this? Where did it come from? What's the evidence for it? Is there evidence against it? When you have that power, you are inoculated against all the charlatans of the world that would exploit the laws of nature on your ignorance. So true. That's well so said. beautiful. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. I love it. Yes. Um, what, as you can see, we have this wonderful crowd here. Everyone is excited to be here. <laughs> so, yes. um, so how has the feedback just been, the, like the, the, the fandom or the, the, the thank yous for this type of show being out there? What has the feedback been like for you doing this series? It's, it's changed my life. I mean, to be involved in something like this and to hear from so many people how they're seeing, as I have seen through Ann and Brandon and, and Neil and this collaboration and Seth MacFarlane you know, to be able to see these stories come to life in a way that they have this deep and powerful emotional connection to the possibilities of who we can be has been really powerful. And then to see the fans share that. Uh, guys, I got to tell you, this season's going to be amazing. There's also a great YouTube video of a, yeah. of a cat watching Cosmos. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Awesome. Yeah, we, you know, the, the title, Possible Worlds, works on so many different levels. It's not only, you know, the exoplanets, the circle other suns that we're gonna go to, and it's not, you know, it's the worlds within us. It's the worlds within your dog's brain. It's the worlds of the ancient civilization of Africa that we know so little about that we can make live again. And the best of all, it's the possible world that we can still have right here if we awaken from our stupor and start do acting on what the scientists are telling us. That's so wonderful, That's wonderful. And uh, before we, we unfortunately head out of here, but I just want to say, do you have any kind of words or, or inspiring messages you want to say to the next generation that may be interested in, in these types of things, but just doesn't know where to start? Yeah, I just want to say a couple of things. You wouldn't be here unless you already knew something about Cosmos. And let me reaffirm for you that Cosmos is not simply a documentary. It is an understanding of what our place is in this world and in this universe, and an appeal for us to become better shepherds of who and what we are of our future. Not only the future of, our, of nations, but the future of civilization. And that's what, for me, has distinguished Cosmos from anything else on television. It's a call, it's an, it's an appeal to have you gather our collective knowledge of science and try to apply layers of wisdom onto that so that we can go into the future knowing that our survival will be assured. That's my first point. Second, I, yes, I care about the next generation, but they're not the problem in the world. It's the adults. <laughs> it's, it's the scientifically illiterate adults who, like, are captains of industry and who run things. And if that's who I'm worried about. If you fix the adult problem, the kids follow immediately 
because then they're in charge of school curriculum, the, the adults, and, 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 and they know how to set up institutions and programs that will continue to excite kids. If we only excite kids now, I'm too impatient to wait 30 years until they're old enough to be in charge of anything. I don't have that much time. <laughs> Sorry, I got off. No, no, I, I, I think we are all in agreement with you right here. So <laughs> thank you all so much. It's been a pleasure to talk to all of you. Cosmos Possible World right. will be on Fox and National Geographic. Make sure you check that out. Thank you all thank you so much. much. Thank you very much. For more on sci-fi, make sure you tweet us or on Instagram. Hashtag NYCC, hashtag it's a fan thing. And coming up next, we have Ralph Macchio and William Zabka talking about Cobra Kai. So stay tuned. Hi, I'm Jackie Jennings with Sci Fi Wire. If you can't get enough of New York Comic Con, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel for news, interviews, cosplay, and so much more. What are you waiting for?